We will now turn to our second paper, uh, which is another area where the U.S. is behind the rest of the world, and uh, that is retirement on teens. Uh, the paper is written by Claire Haldeman, who's at the Brookings Institution, David John, Mark Avery, and me. Uh, Mark will do the presentation. Uh, for anyone in the retirement world, Mark needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him an introduction anywhere. Anyway, uh, he served in, in numerous positions, in particular as the Deputy Assistant Secretary, the Lead Treasury Official on Retirement in both the Clinton and Obama administrations. Uh, of his many awards, the most recent is the 2020 Alumni Public Service Award given by the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, he is, of course, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I will just add, and this is not an exaggeration, I do not know anyone who knows more about the retirement system than Mark does. Uh, so we are looking forward to his comments. We'll have two discussants. Uh, Anna Rappaport is an internationally recognized expert on retirement systems and workforce issues. Uh, she was at Mercer for 28 years and now runs her own consulting firm. She has won several lifetime achievement awards as well. And she works extensively on women's retirement issues in uh, helping job options for older workers. Uh, our second discussion, discussion is John Foreman. He's the Kenneth E. McAfee Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he has written extensively uh, on tontines and uh, for that matter on a variety of other issues. Uh, and he's co-chair of the Washington-based Retirement Income Institute, uh, which focuses on the use of annuities uh, as a retirement income tool. So we are delighted to have both discussants uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Mark. Great. Mark, Hello, thank you. can you turn your camera on for us? Oh yeah, Mark, your camera's not on. Okay. There. I don't know whether one would consider that an improvement, but I think it's on. So the, do you have the slides? Um, Anna, up on the screen, or are we? Uh... Nope, if you hit the share screen button with the little green arrow, it should come up. There we go. Do you have it? Yep, good to go. All right, thank you. So uh, this uh, is a a session based on the paper that, uh, like the uh, uh, dashboard paper, uh, we've been working on and uh, expect to put out very shortly. Uh, and uh, the particular contribution I'd like to recognize among my co-authors, Bill, David, and Claire is Claire's. Uh, Claire Haldeman has done great work here, uh, research, uh, analysis, and writing. So uh, kudos to you, Claire. Thank you very much. Uh, the topic, retirement tontines, using a classical finance mechanism as an alternative source of uh, retirement income. Uh, Starts with, it starts with this fundamental dilemma. Uh, how do we convert our savings to income in a retirement world dominated by 401ks, IRAs, uh, and uh, accounts that do not provide uh, an income payout on their own? Particularly difficult dilemma given the uncertainty about how long the individual is going to live, what the retiree's health costs or investment returns are going to be, the rate of inflation, all the rest. So planning how to spend down the savings that you've accumulated is, uh, as we've all been discussing for some years now, a key dilemma uh, that continues to require attention in our uh, retirement policy and and market efforts. 
there's the twin risk here of spending too fast, burning through your assets and outliving them in retirement versus the risk of hoarding, uh, the risk of not spending as much as you could have and thereby denying yourself the kind of standard of living that you've earned by saving or accumulating as much as you have. And uh, Anna Rappaport, I'm looking forward to your comments and John Foreman, your comments afterward. And one of the things, Anna, that we've talked about before is how this risk of hoarding and the resistance to spending on the part of retirees <clears throat> has been discovered very graphically by your Society of Actuaries work. So I'd love to hear some more about that, that retirees are very reluctant to dip into principle and actually spend down very much. Now, given this dilemma, what can you do? There's do it yourself, uh, but most people need the help of a professional to convert these savings to a flow of income and to know how quickly they can and should draw down that income given their particular objectives and needs. We have, of course, excuse me, defined benefit pensions that do this, that they, they pay the income, they tell the individual with certainty how much they're going to get, uh, they guarantee that it will last for a lifetime, no matter how long the individual lives, but of course, they're famously diminishing in our system, the defined benefit plans. So an alternative is the commercial annuity which permits a 401k or a DC plan, which would otherwise be unable to promise benefits to last a lifetime on its own and would otherwise normally not automatically pay out a certain amount that's guaranteed. The annuities enable a DC plan by purchasing commercial annuities to perform these functions to give people lifetime income. And uh, they are, a, a great solution, but one that can come uh, in a relatively complex or less transparent form. The costs can be high or hard to ascertain for the average consumer. Uh, and so the annuities have not had as much take up as one might have expected or hoped. I do think that they'll have more take up increasingly so uh, given the SECURE Act boost uh, that was recently provided to annuities in defined contribution plans in last year's legislation. Now, another option is managed payout funds. We wrote about that last year, the same group, and we uh, think that that is a very promising idea, the idea that uh, uh, while it's not a guaranteed income flow at, like an annuity, there is a promised or a targeted, I should say, income flow that professional asset managers uh, provide, uh, monitor, uh, oversee the investments to produce, et cetera. And uh, that has a great deal of promise, but is not yet all that widely available. It's getting there fast, I think, with a lot of new products. Uh, so there seems to be still uh, room in our system to explore additional elements of this work in progress uh, retirement income solution set. And one of those additional elements that we think is particularly intriguing is survivor income pooling uh, as a potential tool to help uh, generate a flow of income from a pile of assets and uh, generate a reasonably predictable flow of income, although not entirely predictable and not guaranteed, and adaptable to a variety of structures. Uh, and I say that particularly thinking of John Foreman, your and uh, Moshe Malevsky's and um, a number of other people's, Richard Fulmer, Mike Sabin's excellent work exploring how the survivor income tooling concept, also known as tontine type structures, can be used in different kinds of vehicles, uh, investment pools, individual accounts, uh, uh, pensions, 
IRAs, perhaps, uh, various other things. Uh, so the investment pool essentially works like this. If it's a tontine type of pool, it pays death benefits when any of the members or participants in the pool dies to the other members. Instead of uh, the death of a participant uh, causing a payout to that person's heirs or designated beneficiaries, as is the case typically in 401ks or other DC plans or DB plans, uh, in a tontine type investment pool or tontine type structure, the core idea is that the participants share the death benefits with the other participants. If somebody in the pool or when somebody in the pool dies, both the assets that they have in the pool and whatever income rights they have in the pool are reallocated among the other members of the pool rather than to the designated heirs, including the potentially surviving spouse of the individual member. So this means if you die early relative to the others, you end up being a, a net a contributor to the, to the pool. You've invested, you put uh, some money in, uh, you died pretty early and a little like the fear of buying an annuity and then getting hit by the proverbial bus the day after you bought it, uh, you may end up having gotten a relatively little for your investment by way of payouts. Alternatively though, if you die later than um, many other people or later than expected, you can be a net receiver of benefits. That is the mortality credits, the credits that are generated as death benefits arise when people die and are allocated to, to the survivors, which in this scenario where you're a long lived person, you're one of those survivors for a very long time. And because of this structure, you need an irrevocable commitment when people do invest or buy into the pool or the plan uh, so that they don't, if they get a, a bad diagnosis, for example, and realize that all of a sudden uh, their days on this earth are numbered, they don't pull out of the promised sharing of death benefits with their co-investors. Now the potential upsides of this mortality credit pooling or tontine like pooling uh, is that it does reduce the risk of outliving your assets uh, because you have a continued inflow of these survivor or mortality credits as your peers, your co-participants uh, pass away. The inflow could serve as a rough hedge against possible investment losses, and the, the pool could be invested in various ways. It could be invested very carefully and conservatively to generate a predictable flow of income, or it could be invested for more uh, growth. And that's another potential advantage, similar to a uh, managed payout fund, uh, that similar kind of investment flexibility. There is no contractual guarantee of the amount of the income, and that's both a pro and a con. Um, it, it's a con in the sense that there's one element of, of certainty there that an annuity provides, a fixed income annuity, telling you, you will get X dollars a month for the rest of your life. Uh, similarly, a defined benefit pension uh, promises that. With a tontine-like pool, you get a fair degree of confidence that there'll be continued income in all likelihood for your entire life, very unlikely that anyone will outlive it, but the amount is not guaranteed. It'll depend on investment returns and, and the other uh, uh, uncertain factors. The upside of this lack of guarantee is less need for regulation uh, as opposed to commercial annuities. You don't need uh, capital reserves. Uh, there's not a an extensive regulatory apparatus that requires 
investing in a in a relatively conservative fixed income oriented way with uh, substantial reserves set aside for a rainy day. Uh, here with the tontine type structure, it can be lighter, less regulated, and therefore less costly, potentially, could have a cost advantage and a transparency advantage uh, compared to the commercial uh, annuity market. Obviously, that depends on the specifics of how it is set up and what kind of annuity, like a fixed income annuity, you're comparing it to. Mark, we're at five minutes. Great. Uh, the uh, survivor contingent payout is something that has attracted a lot of notice. Uh, the uh, notion that some of the uh, potential survivors might want to eliminate the survivability of other potential survivors has led to a lot of drama in the uh, world of fiction and movies. There's a Simpsons episode, et cetera, about the perverse incentive for murdering your co-participants. We don't think this is uh, serious. Most of these uh, tontine-like structures, when they have been implemented, and they have been quite extensively in, in the last four centuries, really, uh, in Europe uh, and to some degree in the US, uh, have involved large numbers, so people don't have an incentive to uh, go after their their co-members and they're anonymous uh, and often don't go until the last person is surviving, but uh, but will terminate when there's still a lot of survivors. Uh, and this is a pooling of mortality credits that really goes on in commercial annuities as well. Now, several challenges here. One is that because the death benefits are shared by a shrinking class of survivors over time, those benefits increase so that this throws off, if you're using it for retirement income, an increasing pattern of income, which is not a good match with what retirees typically need and want, you know, a more level or maybe even slightly declining income in retirement. So to level it off, there have been two, at least two basic approaches. Moshe Malevsky and co-authors have suggested you could invest in bonds that are structured to pay a declining income from the investments. And that declining income when combined with the naturally increasing income from the death benefits, the mortality credits, could average out to something pretty level. Uh, and you could even revisit the amount of that um, investment income to some degree each year, depending on the actual pattern of deaths. Uh, alternatively, John Foreman and others have suggested you could get that same leveling of the total income from a tontine-like structure by repaying the amount that people invested, that is repaying the principal amount in increments over time in a decreasing pattern uh, to offset the natural increase. And one of the potential downsides of these levelings are that it could get complicated in practice. Now, another challenge is achieving equity in a simple way. If every member of the pool had the same life expectancy, then it would be equitable. But uh, if you structured a pool to be homogeneous like that, people of exactly the same age and other characteristics determining life expectancy, it might be too small to uh, take advantage of the law of large numbers. On the other hand, if you made it heterogeneous, life expectancies could differ, would differ, uh, and you would have to worry about the risk of disfavoring people who joined when they were older or who joined uh, as members of groups or with characteristics that have shorter life expectancies. So one way to deal with that would be to adjust the credits that they get or adjust the number of shares if you or units that they get in the pool or adjust the price they pay in order to, to buy shares or units so that you avoid disfavoring people who enter with um, a shorter life expectancy than others. Now, to do this death benefit pooling uh, you don't want to have um, a bequest need or motive with these same funds. 
So if people want to leave money to their heirs, to their surviving spouse, their kids, et cetera, then they want to make sure that they don't put everything into a tontine-like structure, uh, but rather take care of your bequest motive with, uh, if you're lucky enough to have more than one part of your portfolio with other parts of your retirement assets. Now, some people will say, no, I'm going to leave it to my spouse, reflecting the importance, not only personally for many people, but in our pension system of protecting spouses. Uh, the uh, spousal rules, joint and survivor annuities in pension plans, uh, the spouse's right to get a death benefit in a 401k unless he or she waives that right uh, when the participant uh, dies. Uh, the, those protections can still be uh, reconciled uh, with a tontine-like structure. First of all, you could go into the tontine just for a portion of your portfolio and use most of it or a large part of it to provide protection to a spouse or for other heirs. You could also have rules like joint and survivor or spousal consent rules that are integrated into a tontine type pool. Um, and you could even treat a couple, a married couple, like a single member of a tontine type pool with uh, a, uh, a rule that if one of them dies, the other one gets their benefits, their death benefits. But when the second spouse dies, then like any other member of the pool, at that point, any remaining benefits are shared among the other members of the pool. Now, quickly to uh, move through the rest, the history of these tontines has been quite uh, colorful. They've been used to finance wars in Europe in past centuries. Alexander Hamilton proposed to use them to pay off a revolutionary war debt in the United States that didn't, uh, was not accepted as a, as a proposal. Uh, and in the late 1800s, early 1900s, tontines in the US became a huge insurance product related to life insurance coupled with it. And actually one of the most popular financial products in the US until massive corruption in the management of those products within the financial service industry led to a prohibition of the kinds of products, tontine type products that they were uh, mismanaging at the time. This was early in the 20th century and that's cast a shadow on the legality ever since. It's sort of a murky picture, are these things legal or not? And we think that in general, uh, the concerns about that are overstated that uh, in fact, there is um, uh, not that much on the books in terms of state law, a couple of states, but most states don't explicitly prohibit tontines, nor does federal law, um, but uh, uh, New York prohibits tontines that don't pay out um, um, at least once a year. And uh, there are therefore prospects, we think, and we'll talk about this in the, in the later part of this session, for this kind of mortality, mortality pooling in the U.S. Um, uh, that would not run afoul of the law. That may require getting past the T word, the use of the word tontine, which still might spook a lot of people and raise questions about whether it's legal and to focus instead on survivor, uh, uh, survivor benefit pooling or mortality credit pooling. So to wrap up, it's still early days in exploring the potential for this. These structures are, are getting attention around the world. Different countries are exploring or, and have used uh, tontine inspired structures, although often they don't call them tontine, sometimes they do. Uh, they have the potential to be very transparent and traceable and something like blockchain or other new technologies may be key in, in uh, uh, supporting that particular attribute. Uh, the, they do have a trade-off between the guarantee of the income amount and an annuity, a fixed income annuity would provide, uh, which the Tontine type structure does not, versus the 
still relative uh, assurance that you'll probably almost certainly keep getting income for your entire life under one of these uh, pooling structures, even though the amount may not be, um, would not be guaranteed and may therefore not be all that reliable. That will depend of course on the investments and on the actual experience. So finally, the market penetration, what are the prospects? Uncertain, but we think that there is real potential and that this could be an attractive retirement income tool to add to our uh, array of options for income management. Uh, I am looking forward to your comments, Anna and John, and let me turn it over now to, uh, to you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I want to share with you a variety of comments. Uh, Tontines offer a very interesting addition to the portfolio of possible retirement income solutions. This is a good paper. Uh, however, if Tontines are voluntary, it seems unlikely that they'll be chosen very much more often than annuities. Uh, that's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and I would add to say that income solutions and defined contribution plans are indeed a major topic of importance today. This paper is very important as it brings different solutions uh, to the table. Uh, are, we, uh, are we still sharing Mark's screen? We don't need to share mine. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Uh, the, uh, I'd like to start with consumer preferences and decisions. Um, the Society of Actuaries has conducted a number of surveys and focus groups to understand how um, retirees are thinking about using their assets to provide retirement income and how they're planning for retirement income. And they, these, Focus groups and surveys provide important insights about the choices with regard to retirement assets. Uh, in focus groups with retirees that were within 10 years after retirement, we asked them about whether they wanted, how they were choosing to spend their money. Did they like those drawdown products? Did they like annuities? How did they feel about them? Uh, and the respondents told us, no, no, we were asking them the wrong questions. The respondents said they preferred to keep their assets. They didn't want either because both of them involved trying to spend down their assets. They didn't want to spend down their assets. In fact, most of them use the required minimum distributions. But an interesting thing that surfaced in these focus groups and this research was that the required minimum distributions, uh, apparently people don't think that spending down the assets because it's required. So when we asked them about providing for different risks in retirement, which we did in the later set of focus groups, we were concerned about how are they planning for risks? We did that actually in both those and later ones. They said, oh, well, they'd handle that when the risk occurs. That worried us and then we started to focus on shocks. But we found that in fact, at different stages in retirement, we did re both surveys of retirees, but also focus groups with the under 10 years, over 15 years after retirement, and research with 85 and over. People were trying to keep their assets and not spend them down, and retirees were more willing to reduce spending versus drawing down the assets. That's what Mark mentioned, uh, and they're resilient. And consistent results have been found in various studies. And I think some of the work that other researchers have done with the HRS tends to show also people trying to hold on to assets. Um, I would add to say that consumers don't like to make irrevocable decisions that give up, that give up liquidity, bequests, and control of assets. And I don't see that tontines would be very different from annuities in that regard. With regard to planning for spending, we found some other things in our research that are very important. Planning is largely short-term and often very cash flow focused. The expected expenses are considered, but 
they're usually the regular expenses. People think about, I have to pay my insurance premium, not I have to pay the deductibles. Uh, but irregular and, and unexpected expenses often are not considered in the planning. We also found that retirees are reducing their expenses gradually over retirement if you exclude healthcare costs. So my expectations is that uh, tontines probably wouldn't be more popular than annuities because of the irrevocable decisions to commit assets, but they might be more popular because of a higher expected payout. So I'd like to focus us now on the big picture from a different point of view. Uh, as Mark mentioned, spousal protection is an issue and it is very important. Uh, as part of the Society of Actuaries research a number of years ago, we realized that for people in the middle in America, the value of their house is a lot greater than the value of financial assets for many, many people. This is a critical issue. And a big question for some of those retirees also might be, should I pay off my mortgage versus choosing a tontine or an annuity? And I think often that might be a good choice. More work is needed than that. Uh, as was mentioned earlier too, late social security claiming is important for many people. Social security is the largest source of income and late claiming offers a good strategy to increase retirement income. Uh, so another qu question is comparing that with a tontine, but my view is that it'll usually be preferable to claim late first before you think about increasing income through a tontine. The vast majority of the population also don't have long-term care insurance and liquidity is hugely important to this group uh, as is asset preservation uh, because they may need that money for long-term care. And that's a different issue from the request issue. So you really need to think about this big picture total population. Uh, I would say for the bottom quarter of the population, they don't have much financial assets anyway. So this is just not an issue at all. Uh, for the top segment, they're probably concerned about some other issues rather than uh, guaranteed income. And this is really an issue much more for the middle. Um, and they, of course, have a variety of unexpected assets that could require uh, unexpected expenses that could require assets. So they certainly wouldn't want to commit all of their assets irrevocably, and they're faced with these major trade-offs. Uh, but we're talking, I think, about a, a primarily middle-income issue, and this would probably be much more attractive for those who do have a longer-term financial plan and are thinking longer term. Uh, it also might be attractive to higher-income individuals who want to increase their income and would use this for a portion of their assets, and that might free them up to do be more risky on other things. I wanna focus now on the issue of consumer protection. Um, we heard that regulation would be simpler and it may well be, but consumer protection is critical. Anytime there is a pool of money someplace, it's vulnerable to misappropriation and misappropriation is no, less likely uh, from one pool of money than another if it's not properly safeguarded. And the problem is not that everybody are crooks, but the crooks know where to look for, the crooks find out where to look for the money that doesn't have high fences around it. Uh, so the consumer protection needs to include fiduciary responsibility, also disclosure requirements, uh, depending on, how choices are made and whether there's persuasion involved, protection against uh, bad sales practices, probably investment guidelines of some sort, protection against fraud. Uh, insurance is regulated by states and capital requirements include provisions for capital that considers systemic risk. That's the risk if we all live th three years longer, then that means that because we're all living longer, we need more money. Annuities guarantee against this. Tontines would not guarantee against the systemic risk. That would be spread amongst everybody. Uh, ERISA plans are regulated at the federal level. 
So tontines eliminate systemic mortality risk, but they need to be in a financial arrangement with consumer protection. Will it be simpler and cheaper to regulate? Potentially, yes. But the more choice and fairness that you pull into the system, the greater the need for consumer protection. Uh, bankruptcy is unlikely in a well-managed fund, but any financial arrangement is vulnerable to misappropriation. And the more fairness, the more complexity, the, the, more, the more choices that there are with regard also to investments, the more potential for investment losses. If it's in an ERISA plan, that might solve much of this, but it, let's not just assume simple regulation. Would tontines be cheaper than annuities? There are a number of things we need to think about. Um, annuities offer a profit to the insurance company Depending on who manages the tontine, there might need to be a profit or not. You need a large enough pool and the larger the pool, the lower the administrative costs, but there would be some administrative costs. No cost for systemic mortality risk and the, and the supporting capital requirements. But if the tontine is managed by some kind of a financial group, it still probably has some capital requirements. Also, some annuities are individual, some on a group basis, big difference in cost. And the same may be true there. And if tontines were voluntary and sold on an individual basis, there'd certainly be a communication and distribution cost. So we don't, yet, until you start figuring out all those little details, the how much cheaper, would they be cheaper is a question. Uh, on fairness, I think there's no magic definition of fairness. And we know this would be a complicated question because we know that groups with higher mortality have radically different lengths of retirement than the groups with the lowest mortality. And there's a lot of political and other issues about what differences we put into that. So I'd like to just again, commend the paper and say, I think this is an interesting addition to the portfolio of income choices but there's a lot of things to think about and I don't think it's going to be necessarily more popular than annuities. Big issue would be, would it be a default in a qualified plan? That would make, if it was a default option, that would make it surely more popular. Uh, the whole irrevocable decision issue means people would need to have very careful information. They would be giving up liquidity and bequests. Is it better? It depends on the situation. And thank you again for this paper. I'm gonna turn it over to John Foreman now. Thank you, Anna. Let me share my screen here. That, that should, and is it sharing? Is it sharing? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, Mark, congratulations also on your uh, award uh, uh, for public uh, fellow public service out of Harvard. That's very impressive. Uh, and thank you. This is a really a wonderful paper on uh, retirement tontines. Let me get this out of here. Not sure I'm going to get rid of this. I'll move it. There we go. Move it down here anyway. Thanks. Um, so retirement tontines are uh, a way of using tontines to provide retirement income. Uh, what I really like about this paper is how objective it is. I've, I've written in the area, uh, but I'm usually advocating for a type of tontine or for a tontine solution. The authors here are very objective and they cover all the high points and all of the, and, and then go into quite a bit of detail explaining how tontines work. Uh, and so the, the key points really are, tontines are fair bets to the investors. Now it's pretty easy if everybody's 65 years old and, uh, and certainly everybody on this panel is uh, no older than 65. So if we each throw in a thousand dollars into a pot and one of us dies, then we divide the thousand the dollars that maybe I threw in if I die first gets divided among the rest of the panel. And that's, that seems like a fair bet if we're all the same age. 
Now, if I'm, uh, a, a Tontine could cover people of multiple ages and multiple um, other characteristics, um, multiple amounts of investment, different amounts of, of investment. And then we'd have to have an algorithm to solve those problems. It's not hard with Excel and computers. But what's happening here is there's mortality credits. When somebody dies, the money that was contributed by them to the Tontine is divided among all the survivors. Um, now, if the group of investors is, say, me or even the panel, but then with 40 students of mine, they're 25 years old. So uh, 65 year old life expectancy is about 18 years for a male, um, but a 25 year old male has a 52 year life expectancy. The mortality credits, it wouldn't be a fair bet if I bet I'm gonna outlive you to one of my law students. Uh, so instead you have to take that into account. Now the way that Tontines take it into account is to look at the uh, death probability or really the probability of survival, but you get the probability of survival based on death probabilities. And death probabilities uh, vary greatly. So at uh, 65, uh, men have about a 2% chance of dying uh, before the year is out, uh, and a 98% chance of living to be 66. On the other hand, if you're 80 years old, you've got a 6% chance of dying. So only 94 of them will make it to the next year. And if you make it to 100, you've pretty much got a, um, a pretty high rate of uh, dying, like 35% of 100-year-olds don't make it to 101. So what you do mathematically is you reverse that uh, into mortality credits and you say, okay, well then when one of us dies, the older people should get more money out of this. Otherwise, it's not a fair bet. Now the insurance companies do this as well as intermediaries, but what they do is they project from a life expectancy table, like the kind of figures that I mentioned about how, how long my 25-year-old uh, law students will live, 50 years, or how long I may live, 16 years on average. Um, and that's one way to do it, but then that's risky for the company. And of course, they guarantee that you'll get your $1,000 a month uh, if you um, play, play their game. Um, with a tontine, you could look at a life expectancy table, but more typically, you follow the actual survival experience. Um, so who lived and who died, and if you have a large enough number of people in the pool, it'll all balance out and probably be pretty close to what the life expectancy tables say. Uh, I appreciate that Mark suggested that uh, it was uh, certainly cheaper um, and less regulation and less expensive to operate tontines than, say, insurance companies. You don't have to have reserves. Uh, also importantly, you don't have to shift your assets, as in insurance companies do, into bonds you can keep investing in the S&P 500. You can keep investing in stocks. So a ton team can be designed to invest in uh, stocks rather than bonds if, that, if you think that's gonna get a higher rate of return, uh, which we might want in a low interest rate world. Um, Okay, so um, what, what, what does a tontine get you or what does a commercial annuity get you? It gets you pay 100% payments for the rest of your life. So I, I just wanna highlight some work that Richard Fulmer and I did very recently for the Wharton um, and the Pension Research Council. And in, in the paper we did, we set up a level payment tontine like the ones this is described in, in uh, Mark's paper. Um, and a level payment tontine that say would pay approximately $5,000 a year just for a small one or, or whatever number you pay per year or per month. It's level and it lasts for roughly as long as you live. Um, we then sort of said, well, what if you just left your money with the DC plan? So suppose you had a 100,000 and you were getting get $5,000 a year uh, draw out of that fund. Well, with interest rates as low as they are, you would exhaust that fund. If you took it out of a defined contribution plan, you might well exhaust your, your money uh, fairly quickly. Um, when, we, when we did it, and we estimated a higher rate of return or a higher withdrawal rate, um, we've, we found that with the mortality credits, you could perhaps withdraw 8,000 a year as opposed to you know, 5,000 a year without running out of money. 
But if you actually try to take the same amount of money out of a defined contribution plan every year that you would take out of uh, a, a tontine, uh, you'd run out of money by age 84 or age 85. With a tontine, in our estimate, uh, it would last until you were 100 or 120, depending on what life table you used. And that's because as people die, what they lose uh, inures to the benefit of the few who survive. When you get past 85, half the people are gone. So you've got fewer payments to make and so on all the way till somebody actually makes it to age 120. Well, uh, the authors here call it um, pooling heterogeneous participants. Uh, when you put together uh, old people, young people, men, women, and so on. And uh, that's the way you do a fair tontine, make it a fair bet. Um, we have a lot of issues here and a lot of public policy issues. Uh, should the differential payments depend on age? Almost everybody thinks age is a reasonable factor. Now, if it's a voluntary program, as Anna said, it's not gonna sell much more than an, uh, commercial annuities do. People don't like to buy commercial annuities. But if the employers buy it or if it's the default option, then a lot of people would buy either a commercial annuity or a tontine, which would pay a little bit better than a commercial annuity. And usually we would take age into account because among 65 year old males, at least, you would think the life expectancy is about the same for all of them. And if they actually buy the insurance policy at age 35, it's almost certainly the same for all of them. Um, some other issues that uh, we have to think about, race, we almost never think it's the right answer to differentiate uh, between the races, even though uh, the, certainly uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, we're well aware that uh, black males uh, don't have the kind of life expectancies that white males have. Now that may be less true of those who make it to age 65, a six, I, I would think a 65 year old black male with similar uh, work characteristics to a white male that age would have similar life expectancies. So it could still be a fair bet then. Gender, well, you know, when it comes to automobile insurance, the boys pay more than the girls uh, for their automobile insurance. Um, when it comes to ERISA and pension plans, you can't pay retired women teachers a different amount than retired men teachers. You have to pay them the same. On the other hand, if you, buy an, if you buy a commercial annuity from your IRA or from even a, uh, a freestanding money, uh, then you can take gender into account. There are a lot of other factors that also affect um, whether it's a fair bet. Uh, more highly educated people live longer than less highly educated people. Wealthier and higher income people live longer than uh, lower income people. Marital status is a huge factor in, in all of these programs. Social Security's uh, otherwise redistributive aspects are, are defeated because they provide such generous spousal benefits. Uh, because basically, if you're in the top 20% of the income distribution, you've got an 80% chance of being married. But if you're in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, you've got a 20% chance of being married. So the survivor benefits are largely going to um, my wife and, or, or, or I'll get hers, you know, higher income people. Um, other things that life insurance companies would love to take into account and a tontine could take into account is, do you smoke or not? The healthcare system takes that into account a little bit. Uh, how healthy are you? Um, my life insurance company would certainly like to run a physical on me and get all the results. And if they were allowed to, they'd want to do DNA testing to see who's going to live longer than, than not. And I'd like to do that before I buy into a tontine perhaps. So last, last slide, some other issues. I mentioned mandatory versus voluntary um, because people can estimate whether they want to buy into the group and people who want to buy annuities tend to think they're gonna live longer because the inside information they have about their health and their family's health and so on. Um, spousal protections as, as Mark mentioned and as the paper gets into uh, are also very important and joint survivor annuities, we require that for traditional pensions. We don't require that for 401k plans and IRAs. Uh, and while there is a, a, if you die with a DC plan, a 401k plan, yes, your spouse will inherit. But if you take the money out and roll it into an IRA, then you can give it to whoever you want. Your, um, uh, it doesn't have to be your spouse. Uh, finally, I just wanna mention here, because we're in a computer age, we can do amazing things today that we couldn't do the last time you heard the words earning sharing. So what's earning sharing? Well, I'm married 
uh, I've got an income, let's say mine's 100,000, and let's say my wife's is 50,000 a year. With uh, the way it works now, I get a pension based on my $100,000 a year income. She'll get a pension based on her $50,000 a year income. Um, if we had earning sharing in Social Security, in pensions, in tontines, instead, our joint income is $150,000 a year, and we would each have an account created that allocated the contributions based on $75,000 each. And so my wife would have a ownership, actually, of a, a larger share of our co-earned income. And with that, I'll just turn it back to the panel. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, John. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Uh, let me uh, start by just asking Mark if you, is there anything that Anna or John said that uh, you would like to build on or respond to? Yeah, Bill, um, first of all, I think they're, each of those sets of comments, each in its own very different way, is really helpful and uh, very grateful to have the points of view. And uh, I think uh, we agree that the consumer protection is critical and that the, some degree of regulation will obviously be needed if tontines take off, if they are to take off, in order to deal with uh, consumer protection needs, not just uh, crooks, as you were mentioning, but also risks of uh, just incomprehensibility, confusion, uh, imprudence in uh, the way things are structured, et cetera, and unsuitability for the individuals getting marketed uh, to, to join them. Uh, but we think you know, the fundamental starting point here is that they could have an advantage over commercial annuities in that respect, regulatory, because you're writing on a clean slate. And so it may be that, and because there's less of a, there's not that same amount of income guarantee, and that's the trade-off. Mark, I think in terms of the advantage, if you didn't have to have state regulation, yeah. that would certainly provide the potential for an advantage in terms of, some, of being less complex right away. Right. Uh, I would also make the observation, and this, this ties back to both presentations today, but to my experience, whenever you have a kind of thing that gets regulated in multiple places, it makes complexity. The extent to which you can have regulation come from one source versus many different sources, you have a lot better chance of it not being too difficult. Right. Imagine what the world would be like in pensions if we had to be regulated by both the Treasury and the Labor Department. <laughs> right, right. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, we've talked a lot about a tontines as, as a conceptual idea. And uh, I and the co-authors and others, I think, find it to be quite a clever idea and uh, kind of amazed that it's been around for hundreds of years. And I, at least in my case, I only learned about it recently. Uh, but tontines actually exist, uh, or tontine-like structures, as Mark referred to them, uh, actually exist uh, around the world. And uh, what do we know kind of from the real world about, uh, you know, are these really that different? Do they really make a difference? Uh, 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 you know, are they just another tool in the toolkit, the way Anna described them, or are they they have a potential you know, transformative effect that somehow annuities don't have because they have not captured the imagination of the public. Well, I think the rates of return would be a little bit higher uh, on a tontine type pension uh, because you wouldn't have to uh, uh, pay 7% of the cost uh, to the insurance agent that talked you into buying the uh, annuity from a commercial company. And because the commercial company wouldn't have to have reserves. They're simply a caretaker for the money. And since we've, since we've got the experience of ERISA, we know how to set up the money with, so it's held by, in separate hands by trustees. And so I think consumer protection is not that much of a problem. Uh, and we can have record keepers keep track of things. So a little bit of savings, uh, but it is still gonna be uh, some kind of requirement, I, I would say, uh, automatically default half of contributions into 
tontine slash commercial annuity. If people don't want to be there, they can uh, opt instead to put their 401k contribution somewhere else. But I think what we really need is just the default either to either a commercial annuity or, or some type of annuitized product, including a tontine annuity. Uh, I would, I would say that I think that this discussion about tontines is part of a broader discussion about risk sharing um, in retirement and in other financial vehicles. The predominant types of retirement systems in the United States, both defined benefit and defined contribution, one allocates virtually all of the risk to employers, one allocates virtually all the risk to employees, and but there are other forms of risk sharing that you can still pull risk. And Tontines is a perfect example of you can pull risk, but you're not allocating it all to this third party. You're sharing it more among the participants. I think that's a really important concept and we should be thinking about it for Tontines, but we should also be thinking about it for other risks because right now there's been this flight from, from shifting of risk and that would enable better handling of risk in a variety of ways. So I'm enthusiastic about that. I'm also enthusiastic about models that think about similar concepts for other risk because we're, it's very bad. The amount of the, li, the small amount of risk pooling we have now compared to where we were, I think that's a very difficult thing and it creates a lot of problems for households. And then it creates systems of last resort, like Medicaid, to pick up the pieces. So uh, I think it's really important. It's a really important issue in that bigger context. Let me echo what Anna said. Uh, employers don't want to bear any risk. That's why we're moving to a defined contribution world. Um, and so employees or the government needs to bear the risk. And uh, employees should probably bear it. Each generation should probably bear it. And the Swedish pension system, uh, social security system, as Mark's paper, your paper suggests, um, does do some of that sharing uh, within the generation. And some of the, also some of the public sector uh, employee defined benefit plans now have various kinds of risk sharing built in where employees are bearing more of the risk. And if you go back, a long time ago, like 40, 50 years, when we had so-called participating insurance contracts, then the risk was shared differently. <clears throat> and there was, a, there was this intermediary of the third of the insurance company involved, but without necessarily having to have the insurance intermediate, the whole question of risk sharing is important, but you do need, you do need people that are gonna manage it and the management, they have to be responsible and regulated with regard to their responsibility. And I'm sad to say that. I mean, I wish I could say I didn't think they did, but there are enough bad apples that if you don't regulate, uh, the money is likely to disappear in some of the plans. All right, I think, I'm oh, sorry. I was gonna say, I think if you ask the Department of Labor people, they can give you examples because they they protect that money. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, Mark, do you want to have the last word here? Bill, two quick things to add. First of all, I think um, as John and Anna were sort of shorthanding reference to, the, to our paper, I uh, just want to remind the audience, this isn't Mark's paper, this is Claire's paper, David's paper, Bill's paper, and Mark tagged along. So uh, we're looking forward to putting it out and sharing it with all of you. Uh, and then the second thing, Bill, is that I want to acknowledge that there are some pioneers in this exploration of Tantine-like structures or Tantine thinking. Moshe Malevsky and John Foreman, who's with us in particular, uh, your uh, frequent co-authors, uh, Richard Fulmer, Mike Sabin, and others, but in particular, the two of you, you and Moshe, who spoke at a conference with us last year, I think have done uh, monumental work in this area, uh, deep thinking, tremendous amount of creative exploration. And so uh, our paper is definitely just 
something that uh, stands on those massive uh, shoulders of all you've been doing. Thank all you. right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, John and Anna. And uh, special thanks to Anna Dawson at the Brookings Institution who uh, manages all of these events. Uh, and special thanks to the audience today. Uh, I hope uh, you found it informative. And uh, if you have follow-up questions, please send them along uh, to events at brookings.edu. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.